Okay, welcome all to this uh, Sensefire webinar. Malicious documents, a bit of blue, a bit of red. And uh, please be advised that uh, this webinar is uh, recorded. So I'm uh, Didier Stevens. I'm a SANS uh, handler, Internet Storm Center handler. And uh, I'm also a senior expert at uh, Enviso. Enviso is a, a Belgian and a German company. And I mainly know uh, to you, I, I suppose, as an author of uh, many uh, open source tools that you will use, for example, to do reverse uh, engineering. If you are taking the class of uh, Lenny here uh, at Sensefire, for example, you will probably encounter uh, several of my tools. And here in this presentation, I, I will demo uh, some of my tools on documents that I prepared. So the agenda for today, we are going to look at a couple of PDF uh, documents that I prepared uh, with my tools, then uh, office documents, and then time permitting, I have uh, many more examples and we'll see how far we can go uh, into that. And at the end, I will be taking questions. So uh, here in this webinar, I prefer to take uh, questions at the end uh, of my presentation. So let's start with PDF. Now, you probably won't be able to uh, read this, but this is just to illustrate the fact that a PDF document, so all the text you are seeing here is the content of a PDF document, and this is a PDF document that I prepared as a, a text-only PDF document. So this uh, PDF document, all the blue, uh, circles you see here around the text, they all indicate objects. And this is to illustrate that the PDF document is composed of objects and some other uh, elements, but mainly objects. And here you can see those objects just in a linear fashion, the one after the other. But in fact, these documents, they build up a tree structure uh, where you have the, the root of uh, the document here. And then, for example, uh, document four, that's a page uh, in, in our example. So the very first example I'm going to show is a tracking PDF. But before I do that, let's go here to uh, the command line for uh, the demo. And the first tool I'm going to use is PDF ID. PDF ID is a tool that I wrote. It's a, a Python tool. And it's a tool that you use to triage the, the malware that you receive, so the, the PDFs that you receive. So it gives you a first indication of what kind of PDF you are dealing with. And I will run this on Hello World. So that's a PDF that we just uh, saw, the, the slides uh, with the tree view here, this document here, that's Hello World. And then I get a lot of information. So a lot of uh, search indicators with counters. Now, most of the time, many of those counters are zero. So I, I introduced an option, N dash N, so that you will only see counters that are not zero. Okay. So and this is the output that you get for Hello World. Huh? You see the number of objects, number of streams, and so on. And number of pages, uh, so objects that are of type page, and there is only one. So this document contains one page. So now let's compare this with a tracking PDF. Now the reason that I took here a tracking PDF as an example is that this uh, PDF, a tracking PDF, is very similar to a phishing PDF. And when we are talking about malicious PDFs nowadays, it's not like in the old days where common malicious PDF documents were very prevalent and using a lot of exploits. Nowadays, when you uh, encounter common uh, malicious PDFs, it's most likely that these are phishing PDF or uh, otherwise uh, scam PDFs. And a tracking PDF is a very specific uh, version of a kind of phishing uh, PDF. We will see the difference when we look into the document. So I run PDF ID, 
with option N on that tracking PDF. And then I get the output. And as you see here, the, the output here up till page, that's the same as we had with a normal PDF. And then there are two keywords, two important keywords that are found. Open action, it's found once, and URI, it's found twice. So this tells us that uh, this PDF here contains links, URLs, and that it is very likely that those links are activated automatically. So they are triggered by an open action. Then, if we want to look into the PDF itself, uh, uh, most PDFs are actually binary. The example that I gave you, Hello World, is a pure text uh, that I made, pure text PDF, so that is very readable. But most of the time you will have binary PDFs and that's why you need tools to look into them because you can have data in it that is binary and compressed. So the tool to look into the PDFs, once you have determined that it is useful to look into the PDF, that's called PDF parser. So and we found keyword open action, so we are going to search for open action in that PDF. And then it selects all the objects that contain an open action. And this is here OBG010. So this tells us that this is object one. The type of this object is a catalog and it contains an open action. This here is a reference to another object. This is object seven. So object seven, version zero. The version is almost always a zero. I very rarely see PDFs where the version number is not zero. So, but this object is referenced here, it's object seven. So with PDF parser, I can now say that I want to see object seven. And as you can see, this object is a an URI. And here you have the URL tracking.example.com. So when this PDF is opened in Adobe Reader, for example, because of the open action, Adobe Reader will attempt to access this URL. Now, Adobe Reader will prompt the user for permission to do so, so yes or no. But what is specific uh, here about this tracking PDF is that the DNS request for trackingexample.com will already be made before the question is asked to the user. So this here, this PDF with Adobe Reader can be used for tracking purposes. And you do that via DNS and via web server. Now, with many of the examples uh, that I'm going to give here, there is a corresponding blog post. And if you look here at the bottom of the slide, you have here the URL of that uh, blog post. So about tr tracking PDFs, I wrote a blog post and uh, you can find the link here. So let's come back to this. Now, these are different steps uh, that you had to uh, follow to find this data. But you, what you will typically do when you are dealing with uh, a PDF that uh, is a phishing or tracking PDF. Huh? You will use PDF parser and search for a keyword slash URI. And then you will receive immediately the URL. So that's you go about for those uh, phishing and tracking PDFs, how to analyze them. Now, if you're a red teamer, you might want to uh, make your um, document, uh, your tra tracking or phishing document, uh, less detectable. And one of the ways to do that is with name obfuscation. Name obfuscation is the following. Open action, so that's the keyword. The PDF specifications allow that each character here in a name, like open action and a name starts with slash, each character here can be replaced by its hexadecimal representation. So the letter A here, uppercase A, I re re uh, replace this with 41. And you can understand if you have uh, IDS rules, for example, or Yara rules that, that look for the keyword open action, for example, then they will not detect this. 
Now, for antivirus, uh, they will uh, be most antivirus will be able to uh, to de detect that. When I first researched that, for example, Clem AV was not able to detect it, but later on it was adapted. So this is our second example, PDFID. Yeah, let me use option N. And here you see again page open action URI, same results. But for open action, there is an extra counter. And the presence of this extra extra counter tells you that there is name obfuscation. Name obfuscation, if you're a blue teamer, name obfuscation is a very, very good indication for a malicious, malicious document. I think I've only seen a couple of documents over a, a decade uh, that uh, have name obfuscation and where it was not malicious. Uh, for example, uh, PDFs generated with Metasploits, they will use a lot of uh, name obfuscation. Now, another method to uh, obfuscate is string obfuscation, so hexadecimal strings. So if you have a string like hello in your PDF, you can actually replace this with the hexadecimal representation. And that's what I did in example three. Option N. So here everything looks normal. We see that there are URIs. And so let's use keyword URI. Sorry, <laughs> that's a mistake that I regularly make while presenting. I had to switch to PDF parser. I see I get a uh, message here because I use PDF ID, but it's actually PDF parser. Oh, sorry about that. It's quite late here. Eh? I'm in uh, I'm in Belgium and uh, it's 2.42 a.m. for me. <laughs> so pardon for the, the small mistakes like this during the demo. Okay, so you can see now the URI, and as you can see, it's an hexadecimal representation. Now, if you're familiar with my tools, you know that, that I have several tools to do decoding of uh, hexadecimal like this. You have base64 them. Now base64 dump, and you can see I piped the output of PDF parser into base64 dump. Base64 dump is a tool that by default will look for base64 encodings. And if you run it, you get output like that. So it find it found URI and uh, this hexadecimal data here, which is actually uh, syntactically valid. Uh, base64 them, uh, but we know it is not semantically uh, base64 because we know it is hexadecimal. Now, my tool, um, despite the name, I, I kept the name at base64 them, but I enhanced it over the years with different encodings, and you have also hexadecimal encoding, like this. Hmm? And now you can see that it only found one hexadecimal encoding, and here you can see the start of that decoding. It has an index one, so I can select this index one and do an ASCII dump. And then you can see here the URL and we can see with the ASCII and hexadecimal dump that this is indeed text. So I can just do a binary dump and recover the URL like this. So that's another method to uh, obfuscate uh, URLs if you're a, a red teamer is to uh, use those uh, hexadecimal strings, and then you need a bit further decoding if you're a blue teamer. And the last method that I will show here uh, in this section on PDFs is obfuscation with stream objects. Now, like I told you, objects can contain binary data, and that binary data can be compressed. Now, one important thing to know when you analyze PDFs is the need to know about stream objects. A stream object, which it's identified by its type uh, that slash OBGSDM, a stream object is an object that contains other objects. Okay, so the objects are nested inside that stream object. And it can only be done at one level. Huh? Uh, a stream object cannot contain another stream object. That's not possible. It can only contain objects without any streams. 
if you run PDF ID on this example, yeah, let's use option N to reduce the output. Now you can see OBG STM, we have one uh, instance of that, and we are not seeing any anything else like URL action, but they are actually there. If I do PDF parser, and I search for OBG STM, and this uh, search uh, option is not case sensitive. If I search for that in example four, you see object one, that is the uh, stream object. And with this data here, filter and linked, and contains stream, I know that it contains binary data, compressed binary data. And that compressed binary data is not displayed by default by PDF parser. If you want to view it, you need to use an option, option F. And option F stands for filter, like this, because you can have many transformations on streams. Compression is one of them, and you have different types of compression. And in the PDF uh, language, we talk about filters. So to decompress, you have to apply the filters, and that's with option F. And here you can see the output of the decompressed binary data that is inside that object. And here you can see URI with the URL. So you have different objects that are contained inside that document. Now, this is not very readable. So I think a year or two ago, I introduced a new option in a PDF parser. And that is option uh, uppercase O so that it will handle stream objects that the O stands for OBG STM. And you can also calculate statistics like in PDF ID with option A. And now when you do this, you can see here that it found the open action and the URI. And if you just calculate the statistics without the uh, uppercase O, you get this output. You just see the stream object, but not the URI. So if with PDF ID, you see that these contain streams objects, then remember you have to use option O in PDF parser. I did not make that, I made that optional for backwards compatibility. So that uh, for legacy reasons that, uh, uh, for example, documentation about, uh, for example, in sense trainings, that doesn't have to be updated just because I, I changed the behavior of the tool. That's what I try to uh, do with most of my tools, that they stay uh, backward compatible. So now I know it contains a URI, so I can say keyword URI, and again, recover the URL. If I'm not using that option O, I have no output because the URI is not found. Now, I prepared this example here with uh, stream objects by just taking uh, the first example and then running it through QPDF. QPDF is a free open source tool that is very, very useful that can do all kinds of manipulations to PDFs. And one of the things that it can do is take a PDF without uh, stream objects and then uh, replace those objects by stream objects. And that's what the option, option streams generate. So as a red teamer, what you would do if you want to hide uh, your uh, IOCs in stream objects, for example, you can use this option. A blue teamer can also use this if you want to uh, remove those three objects just by doing the opposite. If you read in the documentation, we'll see, I think object streams none, if I'm uh, not mistaken, then you will remove all those stream objects and have them replaced by the objects that are inside. And here I included the link to QPDF. My PDF tools, you can find them uh, on my blog. And here on, the, in this, um, on that page, on my blog PDF tools, you will not only find uh, P 
PDF ID and PDF parser, so the tools that I use to do the analysis, but I also have tools there to create PDFs. So the PDFs that I uh, used here, I also create them with my tools, and those tools are also Python tools that, that start uh, with uh, the keyword make, and so all those tools called make, and you will find them there on my blog. So, that was a quick uh, intro and overview to, to PDF uh, analysis and, and creation of uh, PDF and manipulation. Now let's turn uh, to Office documents. Now here, in Office documents, uh, that part here, I will only uh, consider Office documents that uh, have macros inside them, so be it uh, VBA macros or Excel 4 macros. You can also have uh, Office documents with exploits, for example, but I'm not uh, considering here um, in this presentation documents with, uh, with exploits. Right? For PDF documents, you will typically need uh, exploits if you want to achieve code execution. For Office documents, that is not the case right? because uh, of the programming language like VBA, right? is not, that is not sandboxed. Right? It, it has the same uh, rights as the user that is running um, the, uh, the Word application, for example. And the, the only thing that needs to happen is that the user has to be social engineered into uh, enabling macros. So when it comes to file formats, there are actually two major uh, file formats. You have the Office Open XML, uh, so it's not open office, no, it's an office open XML. And that is a, a standard devised uh, by Microsoft. And it was introduced uh, officially with the release of Office 2007. And the office open XML standard is actually a zip container that contains uh, XML files. And sometimes a bit more, depending on the type of uh, document. And for example, if uh, you include images in your uh, Word document, JPEG or PNG, then those uh, JPEG and PNG files will be included in the zip file. Also, when it comes to macros, then uh, we have another file, another binary file that contains the macros, and that's, will, uh, that's what will be seen in the next slide. So, Office Open XML typically have the extension docx, uh, docm for uh, Word, xlsx, xlsm for uh, Excel. And then, um, before uh, 2007, the major uh, file format that uh, was used was the compound file binary uh, format. That, that is uh, the uh, file format, the official term of the file format, but I like to call that form file format the OLE format, the object linking and, and embedding, because it uh, also is uh, very similar to that technology. And those are binary files, and they typically have as extension .doc or .xls. Now, it's a binary file, and that binary file actually contains a file system in itself. So this is represented here where we have our OLE file here and then you have a file system inside with folders and with um, files. And a folder is called the storage. So here you have the root storage which is always present and then here you have other storages. And files they actually contain the data. Files are called streams. You have the streams here. And, and just like in any file systems, you have folders that contain that can contain other folders or uh, files and streams. And then streams, yeah, they just uh, contain data. So to look inside uh, to those documents, you, you need tools. And one of the tools that uh, are available for that is a tool that I make. Uh, Olidum. Another popular tool to do that is uh, Oli VBA, uh, developed uh, by uh, Philippe Lagadec, uh, Decalage 2, that is uh, his uh, Twitter handle. And I'm going now to show you with again uh, different uh, examples um, how you can analyze documents uh, with my tools. So 
first, I'm going to look at the Zetloader um, malicious documents that were spammed recently. Uh, in, the, in the last week, there were uh, several spam runs of um, Zetloader uh, malicious documents, and these were spreadsheets that used Excel 4 macros. So Excel 4 macros are, uh, is a programming language that predates VBA. So it's very old, it dates from Excel 4. Uh, it's from the 90s. Uh, I don't remember the exact year, but uh, by somewhere in the end of the 90s, VBA was uh, introduced, uh, Visual Basic for Applications. And before that, with Excel 4, you, you had Excel uh, 4 macros. And these are still supported. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Microsoft technology, and typically for Microsoft, they, they uh, continue to support the technology. Now, if you run my tool or the dump here on such a document, and as you can see, it is contained inside a, a password protected uh, zip file, and my tool can handle that. It will show you all the streams. And if you are familiar with looking at streams of uh, spreadsheets, for example, you will be familiar with those streams, comp object and the metadata streams, and then the workbook stream. But those streams, you will not often encounter them. For me, it was actually the, the very first time that I saw those streams in, in malicious documents when I analyzed the Zetloader uh, document, documents. And when I looked for those uh, stream names, I discovered that those are actually linked to shared workbooks. So if you are dealing with shared workbooks, then you will have those two streams in uh, the binary file format. So this allowed me to uh, specify, to make a Yara rule very specific for those uh, Zetloader malicious documents. So here I have the different strings for the streams. So I have a stream for, uh, I have a string for the workbook stream, for the username streams, and for the revision log streams. And all these have to be present and also the document needs to start with this binary sequence. This is the magic sequence for uh, OLE files. And I wrote this here in hexadecimal because streams in uh, OLE files are first of all Unicode, but I can I could do it, uh, Unicode in Yara, hmm? that's not a problem. But streams also have um, a maximum length, na uh, the name uh, of uh, 32, uh, 32 bytes, mm -hmm. and it's null padded, and that's why here I'm using this um, hexadecimal representation so that I can also represent the null bytes and, and have a very specific Yara rule for those uh, Zetloader files. And um, also here a small shout out to uh, a tool developed by uh, Dissect Malware. It's an uh, excellent macro deobfuscator. I also wrote about that in uh, the, on the diary of the Internet Storm Center, and you have the link uh, below here. So it's not a tool that I developed. Uh, it's uh, Dissect Malware that uh, developed uh, this tool. And this is actually an em emulator for um, Excel 4 macros. And if you run it on this sample, for example, you can see here that it does the deobfuscation and show you the URL. Okay, now, as an analyst and also as a red teamer, I recommend that you always look at the strings that are inside the documents that you have to analyze or the documents that you have to create eh, with, with the, the strings command. So here I have an example of uh, an Excel 4 macro document that with obfuscation here hides the uh, example URL. But if you just run the strings command on this here and grab for HTTP, you will find it. So that URL is, all, even though it is obfuscated, it is present in there. And that is because of uh, performance reasons. So Excel 
will store the results of formula inside the spreadsheet uh, so that can uh, so that they can be quickly uh, accessed for example with OLED dump here if I run uh, this uh, on the on the example so let's do this sorry example I can see here the, the workbook stream and now if I run strings on this I get all the strings but I can also search for HTTP so this is my own strings command it can search so you don't have to use grep and it's not case sensitive and here it will quickly uh, find uh, the URL for you and that is because uh, it is somewhere inside here and, and I will show you later on how, how you can uh, manipulate that and eventually also uh, remove it now we are all familiar with VBA stomping so I'm switching now to VBA code and VBA stomping is a technique that was uh, presented at the end of 2018 uh, by, by the guys of uh, Artflank and also by the red team of, uh, of Walmart and VBA stomping does the following so here I have an example how to open message box so this code will be executed when enabled and when opened and if you run audit dump on this tool you will see here all those streams for macros and here I use option I and option I will give you more information and the extra information that you will have is for each stream that contains um, VBA code you will receive the number of bytes for the compiled uh, VBA code and the number of bytes for the source code because if you read the documentation and I also included it to your URL to the documentation you will see that a module stream contains a performance cache and a compressed source code cache so a module stream here performance cache and compressed source code so a module stream contains twice the VBA code it contains the compiled VBA code which is version and machine specific and it contains the source code the compressed source code with OLED dump you can select those streams and look into them so here you have the um, view of the compile code here you have the view of the compressed source code you can recognize parts of the, the source code and if you use option V to do the VBA decompression then you can see the actual source code so what is VBA stomping VBA stomping is a technique where you alter or suppress the source code so to make a detection more the analysis more difficult so this here is an example of um, a document that I stomped that I did uh, VBA stomping on it mm, with um, Evil Clippy uh, developed by Artflank and as you can see here now the, the size of the source code is, is become smaller and that's because here I have removed actually the, the VBA code mm. but when this document is opened on a machine with the same version and same architecture then the compile code will be executed and not the source code as you can see here then the uh, code is executed although the VBA code does not contain any message box it is still present in the compile code and executed under the right conditions now that was VBA stomping at the beginning of this year I uh, presented uh, another technique that I start to see appearing in, in some malicious documents and this is actually the opposite so instead of altering or suppressing the compressed source code I'm actually altering or suppressing the performance cache uh, data 
when I suppress the performance cache data, I'm talking about VBA purging. Now, when you do VBA purging, not only do you have to remove that data, but you also have to change module offsets in the DIR stream. So you have your module streams that contain uh, the compiled code and the compressed code, and you have pointers into them. You need to change those pointers, set them to zero, for example, when you remove that code. And that's something you can see with my tool, OLIDUMP. If you use option I here, you can see that the compiled code is not present, only um, compressed VBA source code. So if you look at the stream here, you only see, sorry, if you look at the stream for uh, that module stream, you only see the compressed VBA source code. There is no compiled code. And if you run this, then the code is executed. And this is here different than VBA stomping. This will always work because that performance cache data is actually optional. And the absence of a comp uh, compiled source code is not an indication of uh, maliciousness. There are a couple of commercial tools uh, and also open source tools that allow you to generate a spreadsheet, for example, that will not have compiled code. And that is because the way to compile code that is a proprietary uh, technique that is not uh, publicly documented by Microsoft. And so those tools cannot implement that. But that means if you do VBA purging, that this will always work because you have the VBA source code. It's not like VBA stomping. So why am I talking about these two techniques, uh, VBA source, uh, VBA stomping and VBA purging? Well, first of all, as an analyst, you need to be aware of them. So if VBA stomping, for example, has been executed, then you need to look at both uh, components. And for example, only VBA will help you with that uh, to compare those uh, two components of the stream to determine if uh, what you're seeing in the source code might be different from what is in the compiled code. Now here I have a sample um, that was submitted to VirusTotal that I submitted and scanned at the end of, two, in December 2019. And this is actually the malicious a document that was used by the Walmart uh, red team during their presentation on VBA stomping. And this document, a real malicious document, uh, back then in December 2019, had 44 detections. When I applied VBA stomping on this document, I, we only have 15 detections, again, in December 2019 that was and and I have also included the links to those documents if you want to take a closer look so 44 uh, versus 15 so that means that a lot of static antivirus engines and because on uh, virus total is typically static antivirus engines uh, static antivirus engines will uh, a lot of them will look at the compile code and not as source at the source code at least on, on virus total. Now I'm highlighting two of them here, Arcabit and Icarus, because they will come back here with this sample. This is the same sample, but the purge sample. So here I uh, removed the compile code and I left the source code in place. And you can see here also a very low detection rate. And again, those two Arcabit and Icarus antivirus. And those are actually for this sample and a couple of other samples that I did. Those are actually the, the two antivirus programs on virus total in, in these configurations that will uh, detect the three samples, uh, regardless if they are purged or, or uh, stomped. While most of the other antiviruses, we only detect one of them uh, samples here. So the stomped or, or the purged. So as a red teamer, you, you have now two, two options. You can do VBA stomping to make uh, analysis and detection more uh, difficult, or you can use VBA purging to, to make detection more difficult. 
Now, another thing that uh, I want to talk about is code signing tampering. So VBA code can be signed. And this is a technique that I uh, released uh, a couple of weeks ago. And instead of suppressing the performance cache, we are going to alter the performance cache. So by altering the performance cache, we can actually tamper with code signed VBA code without invalidating the signature. And if you uh, want more details, you can look at our, the blog post here that I wrote. Now, if you look at the documentation of Microsoft, uh, when it comes to signing of VBA code, they talk about content hashes. Content hashes is what is used to do the signing. So you calculate the hash and the hash is signed. And if you look at the uh, algorithm for uh, content hashes, you will see that they look at references, modules, uh, uh, module metadata, references. And then here for each module stream, they look at the compressed source code. You will not see any reference to the performance cache data here in this algorithm. So the performance cache data is in your for content hashes. Here I have made an example of a simple auto open message box that I have signed with a code signing certificate that I have. And this is the, the signed document. The, I do the analysis of the signed document with OLE dump. So I have how to open at source, that source code that displays a message box. And here I'm using a tool developed um, starting from 2016, if I'm not uh, mistaken, by Veselin Bonchev, which is called P-Code Dump. And uh, P-Code Dump is a tool that will analyze the decompiled, uh, sorry, the compiled code. And here you can see that we have a function, how to open, a string hello, and a message box. So that's the decompiled code that you can see with this tool. And here now that other document, that is the document that I have uh, tampered with. So again, if you look at the source code, you have a message box, hello. But if you look at the compiled code, function auto open, that has not changed. But as you can uh, already guess, I change the message box so I no longer display a message box uh, but uh, I'm doing the classic trick of a running calculator and so you have string calc and here shell call so what we have here as a document we have message box hello in the source code which is signed and we no longer have message box hello in the performance cache, but we have launch calculator in the performance cache. And the signature remains valid because the content hash only takes a look at the compressed source code and metadata, but not at the performance cache data. And then as you can imagine, you, you run this, you enable, and then you have calculator that, that is launched. So <clears throat> that was um, a quick overview of how you analyze Office documents. Uh, we looked at documents with Excel macros, and we looked at documents with VBA code. How you analyze them, and how you can use techniques as a red teamer to uh, reduce uh, detections like uh, VBA stomping and VBA purging. Now, some other examples uh, that I prepared here. You can also have AutoCAD uh, that contains VBA code. So AutoCAD um, is a CAD program, so a drawing program, and it can contain VBA code. And I have here an example, a drawing here. And if I just run all dump on it, you will get an error. It, it is not a valid OLE file, and, and that's uh, normal, and it, it's an AutoCAD file, a DVG, uh, DWG file. But what is specific on DWG files is that they can contain VBA code. And when they, can, when they contain VBA code, they actually contain an embedded OLE file. So somewhere in that binary file, 
an OLE file is embedded. And what I did back then uh, to uh, support the analysis of documents like uh, drawing files uh, by uh, OLEDump is not that I added yet another format that OLEDump would support, but I added an option, option find, so that you can find embedded OLE files in any binary data that you presented. Uh, so and here the binary data that I'm presenting it is a drawing file. And what you will do in a first step is find and use option L for listing. And that will give you a list of potentially embedded OLE files. So it's actually looking for that magic sequence, uh, uh, the uh, doc file, uh, that the magic byte sequence. And here it found one at position, hexadecimal position 8090. So you could extract that file from that position and then do the analysis uh, with OLEDump. But there's a quicker way. This uh, embedded OLE file, potentially embedded uh, OLE file, is has index one. So now when you have produced a listing, I can do find one. So notice the difference. It's not that obvious, but that's a L for listing and that's a one for one. And when I do that, it uh, extracts the OLE file and does the analysis for you. And then you can, for example, select stream tree, which has the M indicator for macro. So I can select stream tree and do the VBA decompression. And then I will see the VBA source code. And here you can see, instead of auto open, RCAT document activate, that's the name of the function that will display a message box. So when that document, uh, when that drawing is opened in AutoCAD and when it receives the focus, the message box will be dis displayed. And again, it is like in uh, Office, the, the user has to enable macros before they run. They will not run automatically. Well, they will run automatically, but it uh, requires uh, that the user accepts a warning. Another example here that uh, as a, a red teamer, you, you could also use uh, for obfuscation. And this is an example uh, that I've seen several malicious documents, uh, I mean, common malware in the wild. And I wrote about it on the SANS uh, Internet Storm Center diary. Here is the link. What this is, is a PDF file that contains an office document and that office document contains VBA code. Because PDF documents, they can embed files. So let me run PDF ID, option N, on doc1.pdf. Doc That's my example. And as you can see here, it contains an open action, JavaScript, and an embedded file. Let's take a look at the JavaScript because we have not done that before. So PDF parser, search for JavaScript. And here you can read the JavaScript. Now, if you look up uh, the reference of uh, Adobe Reader, what this will do is extract the embedded document write it to a temporary folder. You have no control of where it is written, but it is written in a user's temporary folder with the name doc1.doc, and then it is launched. So that means that the user receives a warning. When the user accepts the warning, then the application will be launched to open that uh, document. So that will be Word that will be launched. So the thing that you want to do then is to recover that file so let's search for embedded. Here, embedded file is in object eight. So I'm going to go to object eight. And as you can see, it contains a stream. So it contains binary data and that binary data is the embedded file. So I can filter this to do the decompression. And then I have here the, the hexadecimal representation, but that's not what we want. 
what we want is the, the binary representation. So I'm going to dump this. I can dump this to a file, this doc.vir, for example. That's not what I'm going to do because I like uh, to pipe my output into different of my other tools. So I'm going to pipe this to standard out, indicated with the dash here. And then I can pipe this directly into OLEDump. And then you have immediately the, the analysis of the embedded document. And then you can select stream seven and do the decompilation, uh, not decompilation, decompression, sorry. And see that calculator will be launched. PDF encryption. <clears throat> Another way to um, make analysis of PDF documents and, and documents in general more difficult is to use encryption. And when it comes to PDF encryption, you have two types of encryption. You have encryption for DRM and you have encryption for confidentiality. And it makes a difference to the end user. Now, if um, as a red teamer, you want to obfuscate the, or make detection of your PDF documents more difficult by doing encryption, DRM encryption, then you can also use QPDF. And this is here the command that I use and uh, that you will use to uh, take your input and produce a, a decrypt, uh, encrypted sorry, PDF. And as a blue teamer, if you want to do the decryption, it's a similar command uh, for DRM. Now, this command takes two passwords. The user password, which is empty. This is an, uh, an empty string. So there is no user password, and this is the owner password. And then some other data, like the uh, number of uh, bits of the key 40, it's, it's the basic uh, PDF encryption, so 40-bit key is, is quite weak. So if you do this, you have encrypted your document. And now a DRM document, is a PDF, is quite specific, because when you open that document, as a, as a user, you don't have to type any password. So it is encrypted, but the user doesn't have to type the password to do the decryption. That's because the, the password and, and some other metadata is embedded as a hash in, inside the PDF document, and then the reader can use it to render it. And you might have already recognized this, found this. For example, if you, you open a PDF, and you cannot, for example, print that PDF or copy or select and copy data in that PDF. And that's because of DRM encryption. If you do DRM decryption, you just have to tell it to decrypt. You don't have to provide a password. QPDF will uh, calculate the password for DRM uh, encryption and do the decryption for you. When you encrypt, documents, uh, PDF documents for confidentiality, <clears throat> then you provide a user password. Uh, so my owner password here is secret, but my user password is password. And when this document, sorry, I need to take a drink. <clears throat> so when a user opens this document, uh, this output, then the user will have to type the password. Otherwise, it, it cannot be uh, decrypted. And in the, as a blue teamer, you have to also to know the password and to provide it. If you don't know the password, if you look at the uh, SANS uh, blog and, or uh, my blog and look for password cracking, I also have different examples of passwording and key cracking when it comes to PDF. So, <clears throat> Encryption of PDF documents will make your uh, life as an analyst more difficult because you need to do the decryption. And, and as a pen test, as a, as a red team, it is something that you can use to uh, try to uh, evade detection. Because if a document is uh, encrypted, then you know, the different uh, detection engines like antivirus engines might have uh, difficulties to do to do the decryption and so some antivirus uh, engines for example will not be able to do the decryption and so they will won't detect anything uh, and especially ids rules and yara rules uh, they won't see anything 
And I'm going to finish here with MS Office encryption, Velvet Sweatshop. And I have a blog post about this. So you also have uh, encryption for Office documents. If you look at an encrypted document with OLI dump, you will see this kind of streams. And when you see this, you know that you are dealing with an encrypted Office document. And, and then you need to do the decryption. And I also have a tool for that, which is called MSOF CryptoCrack. And here you can see the password that is found a uh, Velvet Sweatshop. Now, why that password Velvet Sweatshop? If, if you are not aware about that password, it's actually a hard-coded password that Microsoft introduced in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken, into Excel to have read-only documents. So that means the following, and it only works for Excel. It doesn't work for Word or uh, for PowerPoint. It only works for Excel. If you encrypt an Excel document with the password Velvet Sweatshop, and you type that password Velvet Sweatshop, then the document will be encrypted, like you can see here. But the end user who will receive the document will not have to type the password. The, the user will uh, immediately see the, the content of the Excel spreadsheet. And uh, back then when I discovered this, so, um, so there is no date, but I think it was about two years ago that I found uh, malicious samples like that. I, I wasn't aware about Velvet Sweatshop, so, so I look, had to look that up. But, and back then, the only antivirus that was able to detect samples like that was Kaspersky. Right? On virus total, there was Kaspersky. There was no other virus, uh, that antivirus engine back then, that was able to do the decryption with the password Velvet Sweatshop. But now, also these things are uh, improving. So I'm going to skip this, and uh, I will take questions now. Yeah, and before I take questions, at the end here of the presentation, uh, you have. Uh, some links to the Storm Center and uh, the Enviso and uh, my own blog. Okay. So yeah, there will be a copy of the slides available. Yes, uh, we, so a question about uh, Excel 4 macros, uh, the Z loader, yes, there are, um, there are uh, diary entries on the Internet Storm Center. Do I see a lot of uh, PDF documents that are protected uh, with uh, passwords from time to time? It's not that often for the moment that I see them. What I mainly see is um, other, other uh, scam uh, documents, so fraudulent documents, uh, which have no uh, phishing component or malicious uh, code execution component, so uh, scam documents like for ex fraudulent documents, like for example, uh, people who want to initiate a financial transaction through a PDF document, uh, or uh, else uh, phishing documents. Yes, uh, I also have a YouTube blog. So if you go to uh, my um, my uh, sorry my blog blog.ddstalent.com or ddstalent.com, you will find my YouTube blog. And um, something I started in 2006, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a link to the tools. Yeah, uh, I have that at the beginning. Uh, if you look at the first slide with my name. Uh, then you have a link to, to all my tools, and they're also on GitHub. Uh, if you type uh, GitHub DDS Davis, uh, you will find it. Yeah. Okay, the, in all of them, the difference between uppercase M and lowercase M, it, it's the following. When it's a uppercase M, then it contains code that 
the developer or the malware author actually uh, created so that it typed. If it's a lowercase m, it actually only contains metadata. If you look at the code at the beginning, there are attributes. Those attributes is something that is hidden to uh, a developer in the VBA editor. It is something internal, but it is contained in the compiled, sorry, in the source code. Huh? So the letter lowercase m tells you that you only have attributes. Huh? So you want to focus first on the uppercase m. Okay, so for QPDF tool, what is the difference between the owner and the user password? Well, the name tells it. If it's a user password, then the user has to type it when the document is opened. And when that user password is empty, blank, use an empty string, then the user will not have to type a password. The owner password is the password that you as an owner can use to restrict the user in his uh, rights. So for example, that he is not able to print. That's the password that uh, you use, the owner password. How often do I see VBA purging in the wild? Well, in February, I started to see some samples. That's why I wrote that uh, uh, blog post about it, because it's a technique that I discovered, I think, uh, also uh, at the end of 2018, when we were talking about VBA uh, stomping. And VBA purging is also something that I see with non-malicious documents, because there is a very large community of Excel developers that are busy uh, developing for at least 25 years, uh, all kinds of uh, Excel spreadsheets and macros, and many of them also commercialize their tools. And you have tools to sanitize those documents that they uh, produce. And I discovered that what those commercial tools are actually doing, and I'm referencing them in the blog post, and what those tools are doing is that they are actually purging, so one of the things they are doing is purging that compiled code. So demos are performed on single files. Is it possible to schedule the analysis on multiple files or folder? Uh, this is usually the need of uh, enterprises. Yeah, with, with my PDF tools, you can do that. With my OLEDM tool, you, you cannot. You have to just use a, a small script. But if you look at the documentation, and, and just let me show you this. So you have my tool, OLEDM, and it's the case with many of my tools, and you have a help. You also have a MAN page, and the MAN page is embedded. And the MAN page uh, can be viewed in most of the cases with a lowercase m, like this. And then you have a very long MAN page. And here at the, at the end of the MAN page for OLEDump, you will see the return code. And you have the following return codes, zero when the file is not an OLE file, one with is an uh, when it is an OLE file without macros, and two, when it is an OLE file with macros. Um, so you could use a, a shell script to run uh, OLE dump on different tools, and then if you see that the return code is two, then you put uh, the, the file aside for further analysis. Many of my tools have uh, a man page, so the question is, uh, I have all my other tools a man page. Most of my tools have uh, a man page. My, my PDF tools actually have a very limited man page. And the reason is the following. Back then in 2008, when I started the development of my PDF tools, I didn't have the ID to include a man page inside my tool itself, okay? And what I did back then is write a, a free ebook on the analysis of uh, PDF documents. And um, as I, as I like irony, uh, uh, that document, that free PDF book, is a PDF itself. <laughs> and if you look at the mount page of PDF parser, if I'm not mistaken, I reference that free book. Let's see. Yeah, indeed. Huh? So this manual here, I reference the, the free ebook. And then I only included a, a small um, 
month page about the new options that I started uh, to introduce in PDF parser. Uh, but uh, I did not backport that, but most of my tools will um, include a month page. Okay, so I, I will leave it uh, here. I thank you for attention. I hope uh, that uh, you enjoyed this presentation. And uh, so, sorry, uh, it's actually a pity uh, that uh, we have to do this uh, online. I, 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 w I intended to come to Washington and, and meet you all, but that will probably be for another time. Okay, thank you. <laughs>